leads to evangelism. You know, the target coming up is Karu Karu Union Impact 2020. And with us this evening is a spiritual lieutenant, Pastor Heskef Matthew. He is the sportship director and the advisor to the president in evangelism. And so we give a resolving amen for the soldier of God. Amen. We are very thankful he could have left his family and to be here to nurture us in the vineyard of evangelism. But before he comes, we will have a special item of music from Sister Pollock. Sister Pollock. There's a voice that cries out in the silence, searching for a heart that will know longing for a child that will give them their own, give them all, he wants it all. There's a God that walks over the earth, searching for a heart that
But it's good to see everybody. Everybody's looking quite nice and dandy. See that you didn't eat too much over the Christmas holiday. Trying to be good Saturday Adventists. I know you had no meat in your plate, etc. etc. Would you say amen? Yeah. Okay. I can't say it because of what I misrepresent the truth. But I am becoming. I am becoming. I am resolved to have no finger licking and anything that is animated. Would you pray for me? I, I am on that journey. Do you appreciate my honesty? Yeah. Okay. And anybody, is anybody else willing to, to go along, walk along beside me? Now, yeah. oh, praise the Lord. The older I get, the more I am becoming convinced that this message of health and non meat diet uh, speaks volumes to the life and journey of Second day Adventists. So I want to give my uh, support to that. And I want to thank uh, pastors for having arranged this, this weekend's conversation. And notice that the operating word is conversation. Because I am proposing this weekend not to sermonize, not to lecture, but to engage you in a meaningful dialogue. And to invite you to review and to critically analyze some of the structures that you have put in place over the past years and to honestly answer whether or not some of those structures are still functional as we speak to the matter of evangelism. So thank you so much Pastor Webster and Pastor Williams. I really appreciate and celebrate the synergy and the team spirit that is evident among the pastors, which is very bad. Yeah. And don't take it for granted. There are some places where the preferred uh, compact engagement is a real challenge. But I'm glad that these are evidently experiencing a strong fraternity here on the island of Portfolio. Now let me tell you what this weekend is going to be about. Essentially, our theme for this weekend is creative pathways in evangelism. Creative pathways in evangelism. And we're going to look at several subheads as we explore this theme of creative pathways in evangelism. Are we going to look tonight at the attitude, the disposition that leadership must possess or must be characteristic of leadership if we will launch into deeper seas in terms of evangelism? Then we are going to look tomorrow at the biblical model for church growth. We're going to also look at a biblical model for department planning. We're going to zero in on the importance of having the personal ministries council function at its maximum potential. We are going to also look at some synergistic or some combined agreed pathways in which you can grow the church as department heads. We are going to look at some areas in how the church worship service itself can become a dynamic tool in growing the church. And then we are going to spend some time on Impact 2020. So I have prayed and I have done some preparation. The Bible says that there is wisdom in counsel. What do you say? And I believe that much of what I will bring to your attention, you are already exposed to, but may not be exploring it to its fullest measure. And I also believe that there will be significant tidbits and nuggets of uh, innovation that we 
will be able to identify so that by God's grace we can continue to elevate and to promote and to enlarge the circle of Adventism <coughs> on the island of the Torah. Won't you like that somebody? Yes. So let's now uh, try to get some awareness as to the representation of the churches that we have tonight. It will then inform me as to how much I will need to replay, reiterate some of what I'm saying tonight. Um, but I want to thank all of you for coming. I think we are having a great start. So uh, I recognize some folks from Carp Bay. Um, all of you from Carp Bay, would you just show your hands from Carp Bay? Uh, bless your heart, bless your heart. Uh, Sweet Redemptive, okay, great. Uh, Road Town, okay, praise the Lord. Crossell, uh, Crossell, okay, Bellevue, okay. Uh, uh, East End, East End, praise the Lord. Uh, Maranatha, okay, Maranatha, great. So all the churches are represented, and I believe that's what tomorrow we will expand in terms of. But we have a significant platform in which we can begin uh, tonight, tonight's conversation. I want to begin tonight by making a declaration as to what has been our premier focus during our workers' meeting this year, which was about two weeks ago. The conversation that occurred at the workers' meeting, though primarily invited pastors' attention, is a conversation that the conference leadership would like to be meted out and given attention to in the local church. Hence, in this first dialogue, I am going to present to you a capsule form what has been the theme, the mantra for the North Caribbean Conference in terms of ministry in 2020. Our president has articulated very well that there is a great need for a revitalization in ministry. And when you look at the word revitalization, it suggests what? What does revitalization suggest? Help me out somehow. You were vital, but you've gone down. You, 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 you are not, you are not optimal, right. but you are not dead. dead. Not yet. Mm -hmm. So it is an entity or an organism that is alive, but obviously and admittedly there is room, room for it to be infused with new growth and vitality. So it can blossom and mushroom and fulfill its greatest potential. And this is the honest admission as we look at church around the North Caribbean countries. So this is my admission tonight. This is not an isolated observation or evaluation. This is the general feeling of those who do the pulse, have conducted the pulse, and this is where we are as we look at the church, not in the BVI, but the church around the North Caribbean countries. May I continue the conversation? Yes. So we have sensed that there is a need for there to be a revitalization. And as we speak of revitalization, I want to be clear that last three or four years, our construct, our major theme under which we 
a parade that goes for everybody? The major theme under which we did ministry was what everybody? The Lord has transformed me. And I want to declare, I hope I will have my uh, logo by tomorrow, that we have now moved away from the Lord transform me as a theme and have adopted a new theme that is now even shorter. It is, I will, what everybody? I will go. I will go. Now I want to make sure that I said that here. So when those to whom I am accountable would have come, they would know that all of us are identifying with the, the theme. It is what everybody, I will go. I will go. But I want you to know that you need not become confused and bemused because the construct does not really change. The name has changed, but the basic tenets on the Lord transform me are still resident on the I will go. go. So there is still a transformation uh, component. There is still a transformative component. There is still an education component, etc., etc. I live with somebody. Beautiful. So, on the theme I will go, I want you to be mindful tonight that we are going to be looking at three main things. Number one, we are going to look at the mindset that the pastor must have done for the church to have a revitalization in evangelism. Is that fear somebody? So we are going to look at the mindset, the attitude, the disposition, the appetite that the pastor must possess in order to lead the church into a revitalized evangelistic fervor. Then we're going to look at the DNA the church must possess. And then we're going to talk about the attitude of the pastor. The DNA of the church must now translate into measurable and practical outcomes. So in terms of church evangelism revitalization, I want to share with you some tidbits of information. And I will leave my presentation with the pastors so that they can share with you even into tomorrow. I want to observe some things as I borrowed from one of my favorite church growth proponents, uh, a very prolific writer by the name of Tom Raymond. Number one, he identifies and he says, what right, everybody? Okay. Are you there? What is church, it like? Church, church to vitalization leaders should be consummate students of risk taking and change leadership. So I'm not seeing it. Maybe my. Uh... Oh, no one says, what do I see? Church. I think it's very risky. Thank you. That was a number 28. Come closer. Okay. Okay, can, can you see the first line though? Yeah. Can you see the first line? Yeah. Okay, so let's, okay. Okay, well, at least if you can see the first line, let's acknowledge the first line, and then I will explain. Um, is that fair enough? Yes. Okay, and then we will provide you with that. So, notice they are talking here about the church. Revitalization leaders must be leaders who are willing to take what? Risk. They must be willing to take Risk. So watch it out. Leadership must be consummate risk takers and must be amenable to adapting change. 
Now the only thing that is constant is what? Change. change. But change, as you know, is rather difficult for people to adapt to. But the leader in himself must be a person who demonstrates and has the attitude and the attitude to know that there is a need for always being amenable to doing things differently. Yes. Are we there? Yes. So, how many churches do you have in church over now? Seven. Seven churches. Ah, uh, could you, those of you who have been around, can you remember some of the challenges you had in seeing the world expand to seven churches? And remember, of course, these churches were not birthed without a struggle. These churches were birthed because somebody had a vision. Somebody decided that they would proceed under God with the presence of risk. And so churches are planted because there are people in the church who want to move beyond the status quo and embrace some form of risk taking. So the first noteworthy uh, tip tonight is that leadership must have an attitude, an aptitude towards risk taking. Does that make sense, somebody? Yes. Does that make sense, somebody? Yes. Okay. So the second one now. The second one speaks to the fact that there is no nothing as status quo in the church. And some people are fixated about this is how we used to do it a long time ago. And this is how we used to do it in times past. But notice now that churches are either headed towards health or they are what? Declining. They are declining. And if you are not growing, then you are dying. There is no status quo church. Even the churches that they have defined as churches that have played over, or churches that have reached a peak in their performance or their existence, and they are neither declining or growing, are churches that shortly will plummet and not grow. Are we there? So churches are either growing or they are actually, actually dying. Here's another important point. Churches that need revitalization must be led by what kind of agents of the body? They must be led by change agents. And we have discovered that change indeed is painful. Change is often resistant. Does anybody have a testimony or can anybody give witness to what I'm saying here? Yeah. Has anybody tried to do anything differently as it relates to their department? Yeah. Mm? And receive and experience significant resistance because you are stepping out of the proverbial box and you're trying to do things a little differently. So change is painful. And sometimes when you try to introduce change, you are moving three steps forward and five steps backward. However, leaders know that there is nothing such as a status quo and that for the church to continue to grow, the church must be willing to adopt change. So watch it out. If you are a leader, a department leader, a pastor or an elder, please remember that you are living in a sea of criticism. Yes. Am I talking truth or not? Yes. A sea of criticism. And you are standing at the front, and by the very nature of your position, 
and the location of your position, you will be subjected to criticism. But you've got to have a lion heart. Are you with me? And a tenacious spirit. And a wrong, quick type of spirit. And when you leave the board meeting, sometimes feeling deflated, you've got to know that change brings pain. And if the church is going to grow as a leader, you must be a facilitator of change and be willing to take risk. So when you go to sleep and you try to sleep and you can't sleep, know that this is the pathway of successful leaders. I know what I'm talking about. I've had many good meetings and I go home and I can't sleep for a good while. But I wake up in the morning and I recognize that I am in good company. Because the greatest change facilitator was Jesus Christ himself. What did you say? Jesus Christ himself. So here's another one. Now, I'll be back Okay. So here is it now. Why? That's going back. Okay. Okay, we're going forward now. So the question is, why church revitalization leaders must take risk? Now this is an important submission. And I want you to see. It says that revitalization will take place when the leader points to the discomfort of an untraveled future rather than remaining in the comfort of a well-worn past. Did you get it? So let me try to say it again. It says, revitalization will take place when a leader points to the discomfort of an untraveled future rather than remaining in the comfort of a well-known what? Present. So as a leader, you are subsisting between the luxury and the comfort of just relaxing in the status quo. That will produce luxury and comfort. Or you can embrace the difficulty of forging a new path. Hear me tonight. If you are willing to forge a new path and you keep doing the same thing but saying, well, you're going to get the what? You're going to get the same results. And that's why leadership must be willing to do things differently. So what's it now? As we talk about church revitalization, Please be aware that church revitalization is not for the faith of heart. You must have courage as a leader. And without that courage, you will fade and you will certainly go into oblivion. Oblivion. The people that will be remembered are people who are willing to try something different. Try something new. Try something new. I apologize for the size of the letter. We will increase that by tomorrow as God will allow. So, what type of spirit must characterize the leaders of the church of the body? In capsule form, what must it be in the body? Come on, talk to me. Bold and fearless, come on, help me now. What type of spirit must characterize leadership? Determined, part of a liar, uh, must be risk takers. Okay? So we have summarized our first portion. Leaders in the church must be what? Risk takers. Yes, I'm going to. But risk takers. 
me now. The first portion of our conversation identified the disposition that the pastor leader must have as the premier leader of the church. However, please understand that biblically and by the construct and even the organization of our church, let me ask you now, beside the person who has been identified by the conference as the church pastor, are there other persons within your local church who possess the pastoral gift? Come on, talk to me. So, who are those that may very well possess the pastoral gift? So watch it now. Watch it now. I have heard, no, no, it probably doesn't possess the pastor of it. But I have learned a long time ago that even when I am the assigned pastor to the church, that there are persons in the church who have not assumed a pastoral role by profession, but they may very well, and they do very well, possess the one. The pastor of death. Mm -hmm. So the pastor, with the disposition of a risk taker, proceeds now in recognizing that there is, and the church must also recognize, that beside the pastor, as a single individual, the church has a pastoral what? The pastoral has a, the church has a pastoral what? The pastoral team. Are you, are you with me, somebody? The church has a pastoral team. Are you with me, somebody? The church has a pastoral team. So, let me forward. When you make your visitation to your member, you are not going as Elder Foy, but you are going as a member of the pastoral team of the Eastern Seventh-day Adventist Church. Amen. Are you ready? Yeah. Right. When you go back to Brown, you are going as a member of the pastoral team of the Rotown Seventh-day Adventist Church. When this concept that within the church, there are other people, or uh, there is a team that possess the pastoral gift, then when one elder shows up, you have gotten a visit from the pastoral team, and the elder who has done the visitation, if during the visitation, he becomes aware that the member who was visited requires immediate, immediate attention by the professional pastor, then he appropriately communicates. Are we there? Yeah. But he creates no avarice, no dissension, or even if the professional pastor has to show it for a while, he goes and he knows and he acts appropriately, satisfying that visitation, as a member of the pastoral team and communicates appropriately with his team member. I would advise you, out of my visit with Sister Jones, that it may be past time for her to have a professional visit from the pastor. Are you with us about Yeah. All right. So I threw that in to, for you to recognize that when we are speaking about the spirit or the disposition or the attitude of leadership, we are not merely talking to the person about the person whom the conference has designated. Because within the church, there are seven elders. So what we are talking here about is that when it comes to the disposition, towards evangelism and the attitude to take risks and the willingness to take risks we are talking about every member of the pastoral team are you comfortable with that? Yes. are you comfortable with that? alright and that's why as a pastor there are many times depending on 
the nature and the depth and the enormity of the item on the agenda that that item be passed and analyzed and evaluated by the pastoral team before it gets to the rest. Are we there to, are we there together? Mm -hmm. So it always makes sense for the pastor to do that. Now we're talking here about having evangelism into the DNA of the church. So when we speak about the DNA, as somebody help me, DNA, what are we talking about? Not in terms of church, but DNA in terms of a person. What, 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 is, is, is a DNA a critical component of a person? Yes. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. So a DNA isn't something that is consistent or something that is flexible and you have one DNA today and uh -huh. We're talking about what? Huh? Okay, you're blessed. Okay, so when we're talking here about DNA, we're talking about something that is more permanent, isn't that some, something that is foundational, isn't that some, something that is lasting. So we're talking here tonight. How does evangelism get into the mind of body? The DNA pastor of the church. The DNA of the church. Listen here. We are not talking here about some kind of sporadic every now and then. We are talking about evangelism moving off of the calendar of the church. Mm -hmm. We are talking here about evangelism no more being, being perceived as merely as an event, but the very life of the church. The life of the church breeds evangelism. It's consumed with evangelism. It's pulsated by evangelism. You, you go to sleep in this evangelism. You wake up in this evangelism. You have a church social is evangelism. You go to a church picnic in this evangelism. Yes. We're talking about evangelism becoming the DNA of the church. So that's the trajectory of the North Caribbean conference. So for evangelism to become the day, it requires intentionality. Amen. Does that make sense? Right. Not thus, it only requires intentionality, it requires, requires a strategy. One Kevin Harney said, for churches to continue on a trajectory of health and growth, outreach must be organic and engrafted in the very soul of ministry. Did you get that? Outreach must be engrafted and become organic in the very soul of ministry. So what? How do we get evangelism to form the DNA of the church? It must become the most compelling feature in the church's culture. That means the pastor who leads the church and the pastoral team must live outreach and lead outreach. Are we making sense? Yes. Are we making sense? Yes. Now you might be thinking, I'm spending a lot of time on the pastor. Yes, I am. And on the pastoral team. Yes, I am. Because the church is not going to rise any higher than the flock. Ah. Are we going somewhere tonight? Right. Are we going somewhere tonight? So watch it now. And listen here. The pastoral composition of Procola is one that has a great passion for evangelism. Yes. And I love that. Oh, yes. Somebody say amen. amen. Somebody say amen. amen. Eh? But there are some places you got to dig them, push them, pull them, jump them. Huh? And I'm contending tonight that for a church to have a culture of evangelism, that the pastor and the pastoral team must live and they must lead. In 
in our church. Are we there? Amen. Now here it is. So I was saying then that every pastor must be an evangelist. No. It's not fair to ask every pastor to be an evangelist. But the Bible says that every pastor must do the work of what? So every pastor does not have to be an evangelist, but every pastor must do the work of evangelism. That's right. Are you hearing me? So regardless of your gift, a pastor has the responsibility and the pastoral team has the responsibility to see that the church is infused with a culture of evangelism. Amen. That becomes a part of the DNA of the church. So great preaching and strong leadership will not be enough to propel a church forward. Mm. Did you get that? Great preaching and strong board management and leadership will not be enough to propel a church forward. Pastors must humbly and consistently reach out for a loss. So you have to lead it and live it. Lead it and live it. Lead it and live it. So watch what happened. I got an evaluation from a district that had two churches. One church scored me high, 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 high. And another church gave me Because the if, if, if you are evaluated, you must receive the evaluation. Amen. That's right. Amen. That's right. Amen. So one church celebrated me, and another church, another church gave me very average. But one of the areas that to me was quite alarming was the fact that in terms of evangelism, I was average. Very average. So they ask the question Does the pastor do any personal visitation, evangelistic visitation? And it was no. And when I got it, my first response was, Oh, all I have done, all I have done, these people still couldn't see what I did. But you know, I said to myself, if, if I were to do it again, one of the areas in which I would try to improve on is being appropriately transparent and disclose, disclose consistently your participation, my participation. Because every person let who say, I served as Bible girls. And I couldn't reconcile. So what's it now? We are going to come to a point where the pastor actually needs to solicit reports and he himself presents reports of his own stewardship to the church. Are you there, somebody? Yeah. So you report your stewardship not only to the conference, but you appropriately make disclosure to the church. In terms of your scripture. So what's it happen? The leader must live evangelism and the leader must do what about it? Lead evangelism. So notice what Ellen J. White says. She says that personal work cannot be overlooked upon, cannot be looked upon as secondary importance. That's personal work. That's personal work. Gaining people's confidence through personal visitation will have greater influence than what? You can't see, but it says what? Preaching. Okay? Ministers satisfied with the stimulus of sensational meetings must also learn to do what? Personal work. So Andrew White has an appropriate emphasis on the minister doing personal work. We are talking here about getting the church 
evangelism into the DNA of the church, the pastor exerts an influence on rivals. You must model what you want your people to do. Are we there? So even though the pastor may be great in the tent, the pastor even outside of the tent must find a place and a room for personal ministry at home visitation. And remember tonight that when we are talking about pastor, we are not just talking about the one who the conference has said, we are talking about all those who are what? On the pastoral team. Uh -huh. So, the pastor is a living evangelism and leading evangelism, and so is his team. There is an emphasis now on the team. The pastor must recognize that if he has a passion for evangelism, those who are most fundamental to the, the, the future of the church and the trajectory of the church must equally have a passion for evangelism. So watch it now. Don't allow anybody on your board or on your core team who is not willing to learn to share their faith. Nobody said anything to that. So I imagine you can't see that. So let me say it to, to you again. It says what? Don't allow anybody on your board or on your core team who is not willing to learn to share their faith. It means that the composition of the church board and the ministry leaders must have a passion for evangelism. We are talking here about evangelism becoming a part of the DNA of the church. If the pastor has a passion for evangelism, but the first ever has no passion for evangelism, you are challenging the DNA composition of the church. If the pastor and the first elder have a passion for evangelism, but the departmental leaders are always in a focus, in focus, and don't have a passion for evangelism, then the board cannot take the church any higher. So those who are with the pastor on the board must be people who have a passion for evangelism. Are you with me? Are you with me? This is how evangelism is going to become a part of the DNA of the church. The pastor lives it and leads it and the first elder and those on the pastoral team, they live it and they lead it and departmental heads have a passion for it and they are living it and they are leading it. Are we making sense of that? Yes. Make a typical conversation? I send you home by Gabriel. So I had a church club, very vociferous, sharply combative. Was there when they laid the foundation stone and could have given me the full history of the church and all of the pastors she had effectively deflated. And every time we identify a really event in the life of the church, she would sit in the church board, participate in the vote for the event. But for five weeks, she became a notion. So I watched the well. And when we went out, and labored for five weeks. And the Lord added to the church. She showed up the first Sabbath when we were having the right hand of fellowship to distribute the baptismal certificates and to sign them and to give them to the new converts. I simply invited her first assistant who was with us through red and so thick and thick 
and invited the assistant clerk to function the morning. Why are you talking about fire? <laughs> and he talked. <laughs> I didn't say if you ever said views. But I was the journey that those who are closest to me as pastor in the circle of leadership must lead and live evangelism. So, her reason was that she couldn't participate in the crusade because the preaching is too loud. The mics and the speakers are too loud. Now, I must admit that there are some people who have issues being too loud. But a woman beyond 50, what do you think would have been the most responsible negotiation as the church clerk who occupied that level of influence, what could she have done? Come on, talk to me. What, what could she have done? Instead of staying away from the music. Really? I mean, she had the option of changing her seat. She had the option of staying on the outside. She could have done so many things. You listen to me. Every time the church invites you to fulfill an office, you better remember that you better be faithful to your stewardship of influence. It doesn't matter how much you give to the combined budget. That does not compensate for your lack of stewardship in the area of influence. If you sit on a church board and the board has voted an action after having given full and deliberate time for discussion and the majority has voted and we have prayed upon it, it is your moral and ethical responsibility to support it. To support it. Are you with me, sir? To support it. Because if the rest of the church is going to become excited about evangelism, those who are in the pastor's circle of governance must be infused with evangelism. So, age 30 is our point of departure. So, bear with me. So, we come now to the church board. So let's recap before we come to the church board because coming to the church board will be coming to an end. We are talking here about having a revitalization of what everybody? <laughs> having a revitalization of what? Evangelism in that? In the church. The first thing we discover tonight that for the church to move any higher or go any deeper in the area of evangelism, Leadership must have a particular disposition and attitude. Are we there? Yes. <clears throat> then they discover that leadership must ensure that this thing becomes the culture of the church. Yes. It becomes the DNA of the church. And if it's going to be the DNA of the church, then those who are on the church board of governance must have the same distance. They must have the same drive. They must have the same compassion. Are we there? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So let's not. What is the role of the church board? Can you see there? Can you see the role of the church board? Okay, let's read now. The church board. Let's read together. What does it say? Church board. It's chief concern. It's having an active discipleship plan in place. Did you get that? No. Notice it says that when it comes to the concern and the responsibility of the church board, the chief concern of the church board is having an active plan in place, which includes spiritual nurture of the church 
and the work of evangelism. We could stay for tonight. The chief concern. But if you haven't got it yet, let's go a little further. It says what? The responsibilities of the church, boy, what are they? One, active discipleship plan. Hmm? Plan evangelism in all of its phases. Number three, spiritual nurturing and mentoring of members. And number four, what? Maintenance of doctrinal purity. I want to ask you that. Do we do church governance this way? When we meet on a church board, what absorbs most of our time? I mean, let's be honest with one point. What absorbs most of church board time? Budget. We talk about finance. Mm -hmm. We talk about church building. Yeah. We Proof. fight over what color the church should be painted. Yeah. Huh? We talk about agenda items such as church calendar. Yeah. The church manual says that the chief responsibility of the church <laughs> board is to plan for the church spiritual nurture and fostering of evangelism. Are we getting it perfect? According to Christian standards, recommending churches, changes in the church, oversight of church finances, protection and care of church property, coordination of departments. Notice what the manual says. The gospel commission of Jesus tells us that making disciples which includes baptizing and teaching is the what? Is the what? Primary. The primary. Another word for primary is what? First. The main. The chief. Yes. The biggest thing of the function of the church board. The manual says it is therefore also the primary function of the board which serves as a chief committee of the church. And final statement says, when the board devotes its first interest and highest energies to involving every member in proclaiming the good news and making disciples, most problems are alleviated or prevented and a strong positive influence is felt in the spiritual life and growth of the members. Are you there, somebody? Yeah. Beautiful. Beautiful. So, five more minutes. How many church board members do we have here? Come to your sister. How many church board members do we have tonight? Raise your hand up. Watch a comfortable, prominent place. If you didn't get anything in this discussion tonight, please understand that the chief task of the church board is to plan the spiritual nurture of the members and to foster evangelism in all of its phases. Are we here? Are we still here, somebody? That's how evangelism is going to get into the DNA of the church. When the church board becomes active, alert, and engaged, when the church board insists that there is an evangelism plan, when the church board insists that evangelism does not become a reaping event merely, but an ongoing process, when the church board insists Every department engages in evangelism. And for that, we are going to stop here tonight and get some comments and questions. May I continue the conversation tomorrow? Are you comfortable now? Yes. Good. So, there was a question.
I recommend that the church board does add an, an admission. The church board does its evaluation and be appropriately transparent in its findings and then sets a pathway. Mm? Because what you know, if I come to you as a pastor, and what is required in terms of modeling and leading is not being exemplified by me, then should you hold me responsible and accountable? Of course. There should be some point when you can speak with respect to my attitude and my disposition towards that. So, when it becomes a part of the DNA of the church, the subject of evangelism becomes an every month item on the church's agenda. Okay? So, evangelism does not creep up on the church board because we are having a crusade. But because we are now transitioning into a process, it becomes an every month agenda item. Amen. And tomorrow I'm going to show you how it can become an agenda item. Who's that going to work? I don't have this pastor. Okay, pastor. And then, okay, you're passing it to you with her? Okay, good. Church manual, that definition, or the wording that has been um, shown on the screen from the church manual quotation, I believe it should be read at board meeting because I believe there are a lot of board members that do not know it. Okay. So, I am just saying, I believe in teaching, I believe in orientation. Right. Okay. And in sync with that, let me again. Validate. Sometimes we need to remind right. or refer, but I'm not sure that you reference me to this. Okay. So in keeping with that, let me again validate what the pastoral team has initiated over this weekend. Because I am content that the best thing that a pastoral team can do for its membership is what is happening this week. The best thing a pastor can do for its membership is not preach to them, but to equip them for them to be engaged in ministry. So for the pastors to begin the year with some sort of training is deeply celebrated. Are you feeling what I'm feeling? Yes. I mean, I feel like standing on one foot for this thing. I got it there. And that's a great way. So I said 8.30, so if we are going to stay the long way, it's on you. But it's now 8.30. So um, do you want us to take our hands out on the floor? Okay. So Pastor? And then? Yeah, no. Pastor Matthew. Thank you so much for the relevant information that we share. I just want to highlight something in regards to evangelism being an item on the church board. Evangelism on the church board discuss only become very effective when the personal ministry comes to causality and all the heads of department are Now, whenever you have a health department, community services, Sabbath school, adventure, when they call the meeting, they want people to come. When the personal ministry is called a meeting now, it's a board meeting. All the departments on the third department of board, you show up at the meeting. Yeah. And that meeting now, you are meeting to discuss evangelism yeah. at a length and breadth. Yeah. So when we come to the board now, we take it just three, five minutes of evangelism because we are already discussing inside out. So we are not fighting on the board to say why, what method, and this method. But when the personal ministry council comes to a meeting, all the board members are not coming. Board, we show up, but the first time the ministry is council to plan it, if they call it, 
and I get from all the heads of the market attending. So when we come to the board now, evangelism is on the board now. So if Pastor Ministry is also key calling meeting, and we are expecting the board to do it, it's going to be difficult and time consuming because by the time it reaches nine o'clock, we are ready to move on to other items. We are ready to go home. Amen. That's that's a very bad point. And we know we are going to stand on that submission that you made, Pastor. But that is certainly a peek into my notes. You have reflected exactly what I planned to convey. Very excellent submission. Yeah, but uh, in the Middle East, I'm trying to understand the concept of risk-taking. You, you, you made a lot of mention about risk-taking. I want to know what is the limitations of, of this risk-taking and I mean, what is so exactly about it. Right. I think we, as civil defendants, we do have some parameters uh, within which we can seek to be innovative. Our innovation must be confined to the construct of Adventism, the inspiration and guidance we receive from Ellen White, etc., etc. So there are some clear guidelines and sense of departure that we can actually take. So the question is within this confine, okay? Um, Okay, lots of churches are seeking innovative ways to do things on Sabbath that are construed as sabbatical, but are not the typical worship service. Am I going somewhere? Yes. Uh, sometimes there are churches in the community on the Sabbath. You see what I'm saying? So you, you better stay within. If, if you're going to depart from the, the regular worship and setting of the Sabbath and try to do something differently, then the, the broad parameters that you still need to acknowledge is that this is a seventh day and you still have to operate within the confines and the expectations of the Sabbath. But the question is, and the realization is, that Sabbath does not have to be celebrated in one format all the time. So there are some constructs, there are some restrictions. Uh, you can be innovative in feeding people, uh, giving people food to eat, but you have some limitations. You don't give them pork and beans. You understand? So there are some limitations. And then another one I would say is you must be willing to take the people a place where they have not gone. But you must also work with what the Bible says. There is wisdom in counsel. So the leader who is willing to take the risk actually carries the issue as far as possible and allow the membership to engage the issue and to decide exactly is this another option that we want to do within the confines. Here is one prime example. I passed through the church when I inherited the church in terms of leadership. They had just acquired eight acres of land. They were paying for the land and they had a massive building program on for When I got there, Significant players were on the church board. You had a medical doctor, and you had another university professor, and I was there in the board. I was younger, and I was not as academically accomplished as they were. I had no issue with that. But I went there and I recognized that the piece of land it was a land that was highly saturated with rainfalls and just not free the water easily. And the tent that they had had for two years, it had become porous. So I had to ask the question, and as I go around to the members, I hear members of the pastor, 
Um, don't you think that we should put down a wooden structure until we can get to the concrete structure? That's what I'm hearing them both say. But when I go to the church board, and all of these well accomplished people sit on the board, it's a lot of my stuff. This is the vision of the church. So guess what I had to do in my 20s? I said, no, 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 in my mind. The greatest voice of the church is a church in which this meeting. Yeah. Are you with me? Yeah. So, what did I do? Yeah. I said to my honor colleagues, allow me the opportunity to hear the voice of the church. Yeah. Are you hearing? Yes. So I have to muster some courage and take some risks. You understand? And I took it to the church. And overwhelmingly the church said, oh, Pastor, let's get into a wooden structure until we can build. That's what I'm talking about. We can build a structure. Boy, did I get paid? Yeah. I got paid. I got an appointment with the conference president. Another appointment with the conference president. Did I get paid? Not real pay. They appointed me a, 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 a building coordinator. Because I was willing to, to, to try. Huh? Before the school of a young pastor, I called me a building coordinator. And guess what the building coordinator did? The building coordinator was a retired pastor. Stood up in the pulpit the first time and said, I am going to support this young man. I am going to tell him when he's right. I'm going to tell him when he's wrong. I'm a young pastor. Already, there's opposition in the church. Now listen here. If your church has opposition because there's a building problem, don't get frightened. There's always problems with building. But as I'm thinking here, that was the, not the most calculated, prudent thing a senior pastor could have said. You're going to support this young man. That's enough. To tell the church, I am going to tell him when he's right. And I'm going to tell him when he's wrong. You know what you're going to do, young man? You are deflecting any platform of authority on the history. Are you with me, Yes. How we begin? All right, so let's wrap up now. I want to invite you to come tomorrow. Would you promise me that you will come? Yes. Do you think tonight makes sense? Yes. All right. Do somebody else? Yeah, I'm just saying quickly the heads, the steel heads when they meet and they plan with the, the committee, they should have realized that they should be a part of the plan. And the reason why we exist as a church is not just to watch programs, we are here for a key and sole purpose, and that is to evangelize the world, whether it's the calling of God. So that should be very key that we understand why we are here. Beautiful. So let me tell you about tomorrow. Tomorrow is important that your church be present. Because we're going to have some breakout sessions, and I am hoping, pastors, that following the biblical model, that each church will be able to introduce a home work which they can actually incorporate in the life of the church. So tomorrow I'm going to have you sit as a church and various groups as we look at the biblical model and how we can implement it in the church. Thank you so much for your participation.